<clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and get started. Again, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us to discuss OSHA's uh, ETS for Occupational Exposure <laughs> COVID-19. Uh, this is a new workplace mandate uh, that requires training to protect workers. My name is Erica Sessions. I'm the Compliance and Policy Development Manager here at CARE Academy, and I'm joined by CARE Academy's nurse educator, Adriana Ware. Uh, we'll give you a little bit more information about ourselves in a minute. Uh, until then, we'll go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. Uh, just a quick overview, little little disclaimer here. Our presentation is intended as an overview of this ETS, and it's our interpretations of the expectations based on our research within the compliance team. Please be sure to review the ETS itself and consult with your business's legal representation <laughs> to ensure full compliance for your particular agency-specific needs. As many of you know, OSHA uh, is designed around making workplaces safe for workers. And they provide a lot of guidance for specific workplaces, but ultimately it comes down to how a business owner incorporates that guidance into their specific business. And so we'll provide this broad overview that then you can take and internalize and work with your team on ensuring that you're covering the items you need to for full compliance. As for our agenda today, Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, we'll do some introductions. We'll get to know Adrian and I a little bit better. And then we'll dig into OSHA's ETS. What is it? Uh, what are the new requirements? What's required for training? What does this mean for agencies? And then we've got a number of sources and resources uh, that we have listed here. Um, and then we'll do a Q&A. Uh, after this presentation, which is being recorded, we'll be share, sure to share the recording as well as the slide deck. The slide deck actually has a pretty robust appendix with details on the requirements that you can use uh, after the fact. And so we're looking forward to sharing that with you later. And moving on. Care Academy is a high quality training provider. Uh, we offer state approved caregiver training for home care agencies that increase caregiver knowledge. Caregivers love to complete Care Academy classes uh, because it's easy to use, it's mobile friendly, and it's designed around their style of learning based on a lot of research. Home care agencies know their caregivers are current with training requirements and are able to manage their compliance needs. A uh, few features here highlighted on the slide, you have an at a glance agency insight through our dashboard, advanced compliance automation so that the regulations for your specific state and your specific training types for roles are already imbued into the system. There's an external training management option as well. So anything that's outside of what Care Academy offers can be uploaded onto our platform. So it's all in one concise place for documentation, which is essential for surveys. We also offer integrations with leading home care agency management software, such as Access Care, Clear Care, Alia Care, and ERSP. Our caregiver training, uh, we do have programs that are eligible for college credits, which enable educational pathways for direct care workers to advance their careers as they, with, as they dream to. Uh, and then finally, as mentioned earlier, we do offer engaging mobile friendly classes that enable caregivers to take training when they need it, where they can uh, for their busy lives. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Erica. Uh, my team and I work to aggregate the full array of compliance requirements for home care, uh, regardless of payer type and regardless of role. <clears throat> So we offer a full slew of training solutions to meet those needs around uh, specifically designed curricula to align with uh, each state's regulations for each type of role. Uh, I have a diverse background and I enjoy learning the facet of every organization. I really enjoy uh, the sort of big picture strategy, but I have a real penchant for minutia, which plays itself well in the compliance realm for healthcare. As you know, home care is a strangely regulated, uh, sometimes not, sometimes very world, and uh, it, takes, it takes a good team of uh, detail-oriented individuals, one of which is our nurse educator, Adriana Ware. Adriana Ware is a registered nurse and she has a master's of science in uh, nursing and has a degree in education provision. Adriana is Scrum Master and Lean Six Sigma certified. She strives to provide excellence in healthcare settings and has worked in the field doing surveys as well as providing hands-on care for over 20 years professionally and personally. Thank you so much for joining me today, Adriana. 
Thank you. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, Adriana is going to walk us through the requirement. Adriana, if you will. Yeah. Um, so OSHA has published a um, very long-awaited emergency temporary standard um, in their U.S. Federal Register, um, and they did this on June the 21st of this year. And what it talks about is healthcare employees have basically until like July the 6th to implement most of some of the new requirements that they're going to be implemented. Um, and requirements that they are that they are focusing on is like ventilation, some physical barriers and trainings. And all of this is to kind of really drive the safety initiative um, with this fight against SARS and COVID-19. Um, it actually limited some of its um, parameters to certain employees. The one that we're gonna be dealing with, the standard that we're talking about is the healthcare one for, um, is the healthcare one um, 905, um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, for the healthcare standard one, I forgot the exact um, one for it, but it is the one that we're gonna be talking about is about healthcare. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, with this new um, ETS that they have out, one of the things that they are focusing on is who versus uh, who can who does this standard applies to versus who this standard does not apply to. Uh, for non-healthcare employers, um, OSHA published an updated COVID-19 guidance, but for folks who do have to deal with some type of healthcare parameter, um, they have this flow chart that will kind of help you kind of determine if you qualify for the exemption or if you do not. So first, um, the first part of it is they want to know if you are a healthcare service or do you provide healthcare support services? And if the answer is no, then you could just move on. It just does not apply to you. However, if you are a non-hospital ambulatory care setting and you have all non-employees that are screened and people who are suspected of um, and you are screened well for COVID-19, then the standard may not apply to you as well. But they have a whole entire flow sheet here. Um, a link to this flow sheet is actually attached in our sources at the end of the slide. Um, but the most pressing component that they want you to identify is who is going to be around patients, who is going to be providing direct care work, who is going to be providing some type of in-home or, excuse me, some type of um, healthcare where they are providing face-to-face, um, -face, full frontal type direct care to folks. If they are not, then they are typically not covered um, or they are typically not, you know, covered. So um, the flow sheet, if you use it for your agency and you go down it, it asks about a different, um, a different section X, does a portion of the workplace meet all the following conditions? Uh, is it a well-defined hospital or ambulatory care setting? Um, all, are all the employees vaccinated? Do all the employees, have they been screened prior to entry? And then it, and then it walks you through step-by-step step to help your agency identify whether you meet the exemption for OSHA or for the ETS or not. Um, this flowchart is so interesting, Adriana, because it it's absolutist. So as you're reading these questions, it's not a maybe, it's not yes to some, no to others. It's absolutist. Um, and as Adriana mentioned, there is a link in our sources and we will be sending that afterwards. So if you're having trouble reading it, don't worry for now, you'll have it in your hands uh, shortly so that you can go through and read it and really analyze which questions apply to you and which ones bump you into the next category. As you can see from these first two categories, it references a non-hospital ambulatory care setting. Now, a lot of us would think, okay, well, that's home care. However, if you see, it's got a little footnote, it's minuscule, but I've spent a lot of time reading this document, so I've mm -hmm. basically memorized it. You see that goes down to a footnote here on the left side and to illegible text. What that illegible text says when you get the chance to read it is that home health care and home care are not considered 
non-hospital ambulatory care settings. So that's a no. So being able to answer no to that question automatically bumps us down into the next bubble to again, where it asks if you're a well-defined hospital ambulatory care sign we can, setting, we can say no, and that bumps us into the next bubble. And if we hop to the next slide, we've zoomed in on those bubbles that will, uh, will apply to us here in home care. So Adriana, do you wanna walk us through this one a little yeah. bit in uh, detail? I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah, so as Erica mentioned, um, as you go down the flow, shot, flow chart, it will move you into each section that, um, that applies more appropriately to your agency. Um, but one of the things in a nutshell like, that she kind of mentioned is the questions that are here that in better view, I'm sorry, I have a little delay. So my screen is just a little delayed. Um, but it talks about the workplace as a home health care setting and does it meet all the following conditions. All employees have to be fully vaccinated. So it's asking you to take into consideration of that. It's asking you if all non-employees are screened prior to entry. And it's asking if people who have any kind of symptoms of COVID-19 are present or not. And depending on what your agency looks like, <clears throat> what your employees um roles are, you will take in consideration and go down to the chart. So either yes or no. If it's no, it's going to ask you, are there well-defined areas of the workplace uh, where there is no reasonable expectation that any person with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 is present? Because uh, again, the main premise of some of this is to focus on safety and ventilation is one of those requirements that OSHA is really focusing on with this emergency uh, standard. So the ETS applies in full to the workplace, assuming that no other exemptions or exceptions applies. So if no to all, so if all of the answers is no to all of your questions, your agency must comply with the OSHA COVID-19 ETS. Well said, Adriana. She mentioned it, I'll reiterate it, these statements are absolutist all employees, all non-employees. And then it goes really broad and says people. <laughs> so that could be anybody that is coming into your business, that is coming into the home, any member of the care team in which the employee is interacting. So it's very broad at that point. And so there's a lot of opportunity here to be able to say, no, you know, I can't answer that absolutely yes. So I, I have to kind of defer to no, and then err on the side of caution. Um, thank you so much, Adriana, for your interpretation of that. Uh, next slide. Ooh, so take us here's a checklist. Quick, yes, the checklist. So um, here is a quick um, checklist that was put together just to kind of help you at a quick glance, understand your business and how it, how it uh, applies to the ETS. So if any of these apply to you, um, then you need to be kind of looking closer at the ETS. So uh, do you provide any kind of medical care? Um, do you provide some care in the healthcare facilities? Is your staff less than 100% vaccinated? Um, are your caregivers licensed, certified, or registered? And if yes, then the ETS will apply to you. Just taking that language from the previous flowchart and flipping it to make it understandable in a different way then. Yeah, pretty much. And then this one does the same thing. It takes the same language, kind of like carves it out a little bit to help you understand. So if you're exempt, you meet all of the following. Your services are only non-medical uh, home care. Your services are only in the home. Um, the professionals or the people that you send in the home to do your service are not licensed, certified, or have any kind of registration requirements for caregivers. Uh, and the agency does not offer any type of licensing certifications or registration credentials to the caregivers. Thank you so much, Adriana. Next slide. So if your state already has rules, uh, this has come up in a couple of cases, ones that we know of are California, Oregon, 
New York, Virginia. This is not a complete list of other states that I've heard of since we even made this presentation a day ago or Washington. Uh, so it's possible that your state has their own ETFs, that they have their own requirements for COVID-19 precautions and worker safety. And if that is the case, then this OSHA ETS is meant to supplement or be exceeded by those state requirements. So where there's duplicity, then you're covered. And where there's differences, you'll wanna to look to your state for guidance to make sure that you are fully compliant with your licensing authorities. Uh, the OSHA standard is really clear. OSHA made it really clear that this is not meant to, you know, take the place of. It's meant to pursue CDC guidance and uh, provide that level of understanding for business owners. Next slide. So if you are not exempt and the ETS applies to you, a couple of quick quotes here from OSHA that I wanted to share out. The ETS exempts fully vaccinated workers from masking, distancing, and barrier requirements when in well-defined areas where there is no reasonable expectation that any person with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 will be present. For more information, see the uh, Is that Your Workplace Covered by COVID-19 Healthcare ETS flowchart. We mentioned that flowchart earlier. We'll be sharing that out later, and that'll help provide a little bit more guidance on that. The next quote I want to share is, OSHA will use its enforcement discretion for employers who are making a good faith effort to comply with the ETS. The ETS is big. There's a lot of things that you have to comply with. There's a lot of pieces to take into consideration that many agencies may have already started as soon as COVID began. You may already be covered in a lot of ways uh, and compliant rather. Uh, covered is, wanna be sure to use that one selectively as it is used in regulation. Um, so you may already be compliant in a lot of ways. And so in looking at this ETS, seeing where those gaps are and then making that good faith effort to catch yourself up on anything that OSHA's called out that you haven't seen to yet. Next slide. Here are the key requirements for the mandate. Um, as I mentioned, the appendix does have some more detail on each of these, but we'll just go over them at a high level. We've got the COVID-19 plan, uh, patient screening and management, standard and transmission-based precautions, PPE, aerosol generating procedures, physical distancing and barriers, cleaning and disinfection, ventilation, health screening, vaccination, anti-retaliation, uh, requirements have to be implemented at no cost to employees, record keeping, reporting fatalities, and training, <laughs> just Care Academy sweet spot. We can go to the next slide. The training requirements are listed in OSHA 1910.502, subsection uh, N, subsection 1. Uh, we've summarized them here on this page, pulling them out at a high level. We do provide documentation as to what those requirements are in greater detail and how Care Academy training can work to meet those. Uh, ultimately, the employer must ensure that each employee receives training in a language and at a literacy level the employee understands so that the employee comprehends at least the following. COVID-19 transmission, including pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission, hand hygiene to reduce COVID-19 transmission, face coverings to reduce COVID-19, when PPE is required, limitations of PPE, and how to properly put on, wear, and take off PPE. In all, there are 21 topic areas that are 21 subpoints that have to be addressed. A lot of them are employer specific. A lot of them are also general enough that a Care Academy training solution can plug right in. Uh, employers may also rely on training completed prior to the effective date of this ETS uh, to the extent that it meets the training requirements. So if you've already done training and it meets all these topics, if you're already using Care Academy training and you've done specific classes, then you're good. And then you only have to worry about getting new employees up to speed. Next slide, please. So our training solution is listed here on the left. These are the two classes we recommend to meet the more general training topics. Uh, we have CARE 0700, which is maintaining a clean and healthy environment, parenthetical infection control, and CARE 0706, overview of COVID-19. This covers pretty much all of 
the general training topics that are outlined in the ETS. Uh, we do have some other classes too, which are really enriching that can be used for continuing education or to enhance initial training. Uh, we've got CARE 0705, Personal Protective Equipment for Home Care. And we've got CARE 0707, Understanding the COVID-19 Vaccine. That one has been really useful because it talks about the vaccine. It doesn't press you one way or the other. It simply introduces the idea what it's used for and um, helps people make an educated decision on what's right for them. Moving on to our next slide. Um, actually, previous slide really quickly, I just saw a small italic note that I want to make mention of. Be sure to include your agency and business specific policies and procedures for full requirements. When you read through those regulations, you'll actually see in some of those training topics, in some of the 21, you'll see agency specific, employer specific, business specific. OSHA really wants to see what you're doing in your business and they wanna see that documentation. Uh, and that is how you will, you will gain full compliance. Uh, now I'm ready for the next slide. Thank you, Ashwin. <laughs> Uh, if you want to know how you can meet training requirements uh, with Care Academy, please get in touch with our team. We'd, be, we'd love to talk with you both about the solutions that we offer as well as how you can fold in any sort of outside agency specific or external training that you've been using to include it in a concise record for documentation. Uh, you can upload those into our platform and use those at will in addition to using the Care Academy classes. Uh, if you'd like to learn more and see what that platform looks like, reach out to us, schedule a demo. We'll show you what it looks like. Uh, you can click this link uh, when we send out the PowerPoint or just type in directly careacademy.com forward slash demo. Or you can email us at teamcareacademy at careacademy.com. Uh, and next slide, I believe we're probably ready for questions just after sources and resources. Here's a list of documentation that we've compiled that will be available to you after the presentation. Uh, each of these are hyperlinks that you can click on that will take you to things like the fact sheet and the overall OSHA landing page, uh, the COVID log that could be part of your COVID-19 plan, uh, and then some other really wonderful resources. Ooh, the webinars listed there at the bottom, that's a really good one that OSHA provided. It was super insightful, very focused on safety, very useful. And the next slide will take us into questions. I have one for you to start us off, Adriana, and this is based on some questions that we got even in advance of the webinar. So I wanna go ahead and ask you, there are a lot of resources out there and I wanna know which one is your favorite and why. Um, I would say the COVID-19 webinar because it really focused on the safety of it and the driving that the whole root cause for this entire ETS is safety, um, public safety, um, individual and agency and employer safety. Um, they really did take a great amount of consideration and time building out this ETS with the whole safety as their mantra for this entire um, project that they're doing. And what I like about it, too, is that he also stressed throughout the webinar, too, that they will be circling back after the end of the year when this ETS is uh, potentially over with and taking in all the learnings. Um, and he really kind of described how they were going to look at the learnings and try to, you know, make it even more safer um, from, you know, moving into 2022, just in case we are not out of this pandemic and just in case we face another pandemic somewhere down the future, so. So you're saying that they're gonna internalize the learnings over these last couple of months of having this implemented and they might even apply it to future protections. I didn't realize that. Yeah. That's really interesting. I have another question for you. <laughs> Why are the regulations written this way? Uh, they seem kind of complicated. There's a flow chart needed. Um, there's absolutist statements. Can you tell us a little bit more about why you think the regs are written that way? Um, I do think it's for employer and employee protection. You know, I don't want to sound like a broken record when I say about safety, but I do think at the end of the day, that's what it's coming down to, just promoting it, um, putting it on paper, some safety the initiatives, the way that we should be thinking about things to make sure that we are all kind of like really kind of protected out there, um, making sure that the training, because education, you know, we do better. Well, as we know better, we do better. So making sure that the educational requirements out there are around it and that 
people are really like taking taking it seriously and kind of focusing in on what they supposed to be or how they should be looking at uh, promoting safety and you know promoting training around COVID-19 and other type of initiatives out there. Like I said, I, the whole webinar too, you know, talked about just in case something else come up, you know, because we never know what's coming along down the future. Um, so I think it all ties in. I think that's what, um, I, I, I just think that it's what it was about. I just think it was all about safety too. You know, I just see, mm -hmm. I have to keep going back to it, so. That's so interesting because OSHA almost never makes mandates. So if anything, the existence of this regulation speaks to their preparation uh, for whatever comes next with COVID and whatever comes next with after that. Yeah, what's your favorite resource so far? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. My favorite <laughs> is the COVID-19 plan. As a compliance person. I love documentation. I harp on documentation. I promote documentation. And the COVID-19 plan is the heart and soul of documentation. It's also a great place to start because it helps essentially analyze your business and what you're doing and who's doing it and why you will respond in the way you are. Uh, it helps create the outline for how to action against this ETS and work in, uh, in pursuit of compliance. Looks like we got a couple other questions coming in. Uh, we've got one. My understanding is that for fully vaccinated healthcare workers with a high risk exposure, if they are asymptomatic, they do not need to quarantine from work and just wear a mask. That's a really good question. Uh, and that's something that I'll have to follow up on because as soon as we get into asymptomatic positive cases, there is, uh, there may not be a need to quarantine per se, but there may be a need to separate them from people that could be susceptible to contracting COVID. And a mask, although it does help in protecting others, uh, is not 100%, especially when you're working in close quarters. So we'll dig into that one and we'll follow up with that one after the webinar. But Adrienne, I'll bounce that to you. Do you have anything to expand on or add on with that question? I think you answered it correctly. Um, we can't really get into that piece as well. I do know as far as what we're talking about today with the regulations and the requirements that we are talking about, as far as this presentation, uh, the regulations was written the way that they were written for a reason and that was for primary prevention. Um, so we can't really get into who masks, who's asymptomatic, who is not. That really has to be done at the more agency level. Um, and so we, for us, we can't really get into that. We can only just tell you those regulations are written um, for primary prevention. So maybe a good place for the COVID plan <laughs> to step right. in and help agencies identify how they're going to address that in their workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, next, another question, does Care Academy have a digital training course in compliance uh, for the ETS required 21 topics. Uh, I mentioned briefly earlier that the ETS lists 21 topics. Half of those are general, half of those are agency specific. For the half that are general, we have those covered in their entirety, absolutely. And then we've got those other classes too that you can use to expand on. Uh, for the other agency specific topics, the other half of those 21 uh, does have to come from the agency. But Care Academy offers a way for you to take those agency specific documents and trainings, uh, outlines, attendance documentation, and add that to our platform so that it's all in one place. So you know those general topics are covered, you know your agency specific is covered, and it's all stored right there on the platform. I've got another question here. Can we contact someone at OSHA directly? I We'll have to follow up on that one as well. I'm pretty confident I saw a couple email addresses for contacts in my review of the resources and through my research. So I will hunt down that name. I will hunt down that resource and we'll follow up with you afterwards. That's a great question. Thank you. Another question. What about employees that work out of their home and do not come into the office? They do visits starting from their home. Are they included in the all employees in the workplace? That's a really good question. Now, OSHA had something that mentioned telehealth, mm -hmm. and I know this may not be exactly telehealth, but telehealth was not one of those ones that they considered uh, to be uh, directly promoting, maintaining, or restoring health. Um, so a lot of times the agencies will have to look at 
uh, the role of the individual and what they are doing um, to see if they are exempt or not. So there's gonna be another one of those agency specific types of questions that's gonna come all the way down to the people level where you'll be looking at the role of that person, person and if it's one of those things where they are front facing direct care, where they are uh, promoting or maintaining or restoring health, uh, then you'll have to kind of bump it across your legal team to see you know, exactly where you fall with that one. Thank you, Adriana. Into our next question, regarding home care worker exclusion from work uh, and they return later to work, the ETS specifies the employer must provide a PCR test and then provides uh, follow-up steps based on those results. Does this mean antigen or POC tests are not acceptable? Do you happen to know the answer to that one, Adriana? That one seems- No, I have to look that up, yeah. Look that one up. Sub question, should HR teams be collecting documentation of employee test results? I think that's another one we'll follow up on. And I think that's also one that's a good question for the legal team, because yeah. you do want to retain documentation for the status and screening of your employees and include that in the COVID plan. Uh, so if your best course of action is through HR, then that sounds great. I bet, uh, the, you know, another agency may have a different solution. Uh, so consulting with your legal team and including that and why you're doing it that way in your COVID plan is going to be essential. And then there was another sub question of that one. In another section of the ETS, after an exposure believed, PCR test is not specifies. It only says COVID-19 test. For that one, I would point to the CDC, whatever the CDC recommends. Uh, and if they've referred to it, the CDC and both OSHA have referred to PCR specifically previously, I would probably err on the side of caution and aim for that level of specificity. That being said, we saw that quote earlier from OSHA is going to be looking for best intentions. And so if your best intention is to get somebody tested with the resources you have available, for example, if a PCR isn't available, but a different type of test is, then as long as you can document as to why you went that direction, uh, I think that would be considered acceptable up to OSHA. Again, I would always recommend consulting with your legal team. Adriana, any extension? No, no just I agree with the, um, with with what you said, because the ETS was created by OSHA, but they took in consideration the guidelines of the CDC and of EPA when they wrote them. So whatever the CDC is recommend, recommending that you do, that's what I would do. Great, excellent. Uh, next question. So if we are a non-medical in-home care agency, and we do have employees who are STNAs, I believe that would be a nursing assistant or a nursing aide, correct me if I'm wrong, Adriana. Um, where do we fall? Are we going to control how people go in and out of the home? Um, oh, wait, I don't think STNA means what I think it means. So I'm not familiar with that acronym. Are you familiar with that acronym, Adriana? No, and I don't know where you are um, <laughs> on it, but if they're talking about nurses aides. <laughs> yeah, um, I just looked it up. If they, you know, if they're talking about um, home health aides or whatever, Again, that's going to go down to the agency specific level. It's going to go down to the person and the role that you have them doing. Um, and then you will have to go back and kind of look at that flow sheet. Will it ask you, is that employee fully vaccinated? Um, will it ask you, is there going to be a screening for the non-employee, which will be um, the client at this case? And based on how your agency can answer that question, um, the flow sheet should be able to answer it for you. So is again, when we look at the flow sheet that OSHA provided us, you can use it for that particular uh, purpose. Just go back and again, look at what role this person is doing. And then you'll have to make the decision from there. And then of course, bump it across your legal team just to make sure to. So. That sounds right to me. It comes down to that role and the agency specific of how you approach it. And it all comes down to documentation. Um, and having that paper trail. Um, another question that was a sub question of the previous one is, how are we going to control how people go in and out of the home? And that reminds me of the 
<laughs> the spheres of influence. You've got the center, the things that you control, the things that you can influence are right outside of that. And the things that you have no control or influence over that are out in your periphery. And this is one of those ones that you can influence, but you, you can't control. You know, when you talk about a care team and somebody in the home, they're going to have friends, they're going to have family. And so there's nothing as a business owner that we can necessarily do to force people to do or act a certain way. What we can do, however, is have policies and procedures, have those documented and share those out with our care teams, with our family members and with the clients and make sure that everybody is familiar with why we are doing the things that we are doing and how they can help us ensure safety. And, you know, in some places that may be a really easy answer and in other places it may not be an easy answer, but simply having the policies and procedures documented, shared and communicated through multiple channels to meet your audience where they are. That would mean, um, you know, emails, it would mean website, it would mean uh, potentially if you use social media or if you have the capacity and bandwidth for phone calls, um, any, all of the communication channels you can hit to share with our uh, people that we have no control over that are still involved in the care of our clients to make sure that they are aware of what as an agency owner you are doing to keep their loved ones safe and to keep your workplace safe uh, for the ultimate care of a client. Next question is, so if we offer non-medical in-home, oh, no, this is a explanation from a previous question. Next question. <laughs> is there a clear definition for promoting health? I feel even a non-medical agency could be considered as promoting health in that hygiene, et cetera, is considered good health. This is an excellent question and it points out to something that I thought was really fascinating about this regulation that, um, that we'll talk about now. There is a way that this is written that in some ways it's really clear and in other ways it speaks to the lack of understanding of home care as an industry from industries outside or from the rest of the healthcare continuum. So when you say promoting health, I know what you mean. Home care offers the promotion of health, but is that how OSHA sees it? Is that how the rest of the healthcare continuum sees it? And my short answer is going to be yes. Um, yes. The difference is going to be whether or not the services are medically mandated and whether or not the rest of that flow chart can be answered in the specific way that lands you at, whether or not you have to be in compliance with this ETS. Adriana, do you have anything to expand on with promoting health and the, the provision of services in the home? No, that was perfect. That would have been my same answer as well, because it is very, um, is very broad and how they use the term promote health. Um, mm -hmm. So no, I kind of 100% agree with how you answered it. Excellent. Then on to the next question. If an employee is pulled from work due to COVID concerns, is it legal for the employer to alert clients of this possible exposure? That is a great question. And that is something that I will look into a little bit further after this. Uh, and that I strongly recommend that you consult with your legal team on. Um, the word that's catching me up in this question is, the, is it legal to for the employer to make this level of notification? And I think it's gonna depend on the state. I think it's gonna depend very much on the state. There may be a Department of Health or a licensing authority in a given state that allows that. There may be other states that simply don't allow for that. Um, it's possible that there are already policies and procedures that the state would prefer you go through in terms of notifications. Uh, so I'll look into it a little bit on my end, see if I can find a general answer, but I'm fairly certain that it is going to be state specific. And so to look into your specific states or follow up with us and let us know which state you're in and you're asking from so that we can dig in a little bit. Um, and then I'm not sure if it's covered, but you can always check out that employer notification tool um, that OSHA has created to kind of help employers navigate this space. Um, so it is linked inside of the presentation in the uh, sources and uh, on the sources slide. So you can kind of click into it and kind of look to see if they answer that one. But if not, I know me and Erica, we'll try to look into it. Excellent. Just a quick flashback to our sources. <laughs> All right, excellent. Uh, I'd love to encourage any other lingering questions. We've covered a lot today. We really dug into this. And I think the, the kind of summary statement is, um, if you're in home care, this, this may very well apply to you. Um, you know, just because we've been 
overlooked regulatorily in the past. I think that the Biden administration and OSHA by uh, following suit are looking to examine the healthcare continuum as it extends into the home and they're serious about it. And I think that although there are vagaries in the way this ETS is written, it does include in-home care. And that's that's a first, honestly, um, not, you know, an absolutist first, but it's part of a trend I anticipate seeing in that home care will continue to get the recognition through regulation. Uh, and in order to influence that, we can all speak out as stakeholders to our you know, associations that we're a part of, to our uh, departments, our licensing authorities, and let them know what's working for us and what isn't. Uh, our feedback is what will drive regulatory change in this time when it is uh, ripe for the picking. There are a lot of pieces of legislation out there and a lot of people trying to do a lot in home care and your voice matters. You have experience, you need to share it with the people that are making the rules so that your feedback is taken into consideration. I want to quickly uh, follow up on uh, sort of a lingering question that we've had throughout as people pop in and out. We will be sharing the recording of this presentation and the PowerPoint slides. So when you get that PDF, you can click through the links, you can print them out and share them, you can email it to your coworkers and share it more broadly. Uh, so you can look forward to receiving that from our team uh, at some point in the next, um, hours or days, our team is pretty responsive, so you won't have to wait too long for it. And then you'll have access to all of the resources uh, and the appendix with a little bit more detail on what the requirements of the ETS entail. Those resources, if you use them like I do, you'll <laughs> open a new window and open all the tabs and read through it uh, over a nice cup of coffee or tea first thing in the morning. Um, Great, it looks like we're wrapping up our questions a little bit. So I might be able to give y'all the best gift of all and give you some of your life back. Um, you now have several minutes to, um, to yourself between meetings. Please reach out and contact us with questions. If you're interested in seeing what our training looks like, see what the platform looks like where you could be holding all of your documentation for this important ETS, contact us at 1-866-227-3895. Email us at hello at careacademy.com. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So please reach out, touch base. We'd love to talk with you. And with that, I'll let you all go to the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Adriana. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Uh, yes, the link to the flowchart will be included, Frank. <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>